to Hacking the Connect. I'm Dan Hardiker, I'm CTO Adaptivist, and this is James McGiven, Senior Engineer at Cisco. We've worked together in the past, and we both did the digital signage project at DevOps last year. And this isn't so much a formal talk, this is uh, more an explanation of what we did, how we did it, and just a quick rundown on the things that you can achieve with the Connect and how easy it is to get involved and start hacking away. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by having a quick look at what some other people have done with the Connect because the price of the Connect has dropped. It's like 100 quid a box now, so it's really becoming an affordable way of hacking at home with some really high-tech kit, really. So we'll go through some of the demos and some other examples. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the libraries that some of them use so that you can use them yourselves and, and have a good starting point. Um, and then, we'll, like Dan said, we'll take you through what we did at DevOps last year in terms of how to... Uh, get them to connect and interactivity at a conference going. Um, so Dan's going to introduce himself. So a bit more about me. I'm Dan Hardiker, I'm CTO Adaptivist. We deliver uh, to large companies, small companies, uh, social software, and focus on exclusively driving the technology and process of application development and management, with primarily using the Atlassian stack. I've been on the steering committee for DevOps for the last five years and have been hacking and coding for, well, as long as I can remember. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm James McGiven. I work for Cisco, uh, part of their cloud security team. So we deal with real-time threat analysis and filtering for uh, the internet of big companies. Um, interesting field, completely unrelated to the talk we're doing. Um, I've been a hacker, coder for about 15 years. I'm a mathematician by my background, but please don't judge me for it. I do speak English, and I can code. Um, so we're going to kick off, like I said, with what's already out there. Um, there are a plethora of projects on the Connect, and this is just a sampling of them. So we're going to kick off with 3D painting. Uh, it's this guy here who is uh, an artist um, and a programmer as well. And what you can see here is that it's doing the gesture recognition, but it's doing it not just for his whole hand, but as you can see from the diagrams on the other side, for each finger. So he's able to uh, map each finger's location in 3D space and uh, control a paintbrush with it. So with his other hand, as you can see, he's now holding up five fingers to, to start the drawing. And uh, if you notice, his hands are actually moving in 3D space. And this is important because you know, this isn't just a replacement for your mouse. This is how to use the Connect as a proper 3D modeling tool. So he's just filling out the, uh, the picture for us here. It's a couple of colors. You see he's switched to his green. He's about to draw some more lines for us. There we go. And if you notice, his hands were doing that in 3D space. So in a couple of seconds, we get to see what he's drawn. And, uh, well, that's it, you know, a handful of seconds and he's produced a 3D model, which would have taken far longer if you're using any other package. Um, another interesting one, uh, this is combining Connect and technology and live art. So you can see here, he's got some dancers. Um, Christian uh, Mao is a computer scientist and professional dancer, so he's joined the two things that he loves. Uh, to produce some really stunning visual effects. Um, you know, obviously this isn't somebody just rehearsing and getting the timing just right. You can see here, this is proper physics engine here. Um, and a particle engine, so it's obviously a screensaver favorite. And people get to move, and as they move, it causes the particle field to distort. And this is projected both on them and the background. So it really sort of fuses light and computer-generated elements. Um, Another nice slow dance showing off. And this, this just shows like some of the, the combination of both the quick and the slow motions that are able to be generated by this system. And I think we're just coming up to the part where we're going to explain how this is done. So uh, the connect is actually at an angle. This isn't obliquely to the, to the projected background. So Normally, when you have things like that, you get projection errors. You know, things disappear at a weird angle. So how it works is that it's got markers on the edge of the, uh, the acting area. And this is pulled in and mapped to what, what they can actually see. This allows them to form a vector, which is perpendicular to the angle that the connector is looking at. 
and then they can correct using a standard post-strum correction so that everything appears as if it's it oblique to the camera as opposed to at an angle. And we'll just come up to the last bit now, and you can see it's all put together. And notice that this stuff is going up and backwards rather than down and away from the screen. So it's quite an important correction that this uh, the Connect is doing here. What about taking it further? You can dance and you can do Connect. Why can't you do magic with a Connect? So previously, when you had magicians doing stuff like this, it was all pre-recorded and well rehearsed, and the timings were had to be pinpoint accurate because there was no interaction between the projection and the magician. So you can see here he's got his little setup in the background, and uh, just a click of his fingers, fireball appears. Notice that it actually works dynamically with his actions. It's completely interactive. He can move it backwards and forwards. He can pass it over his head from one hand to the other. He can even capture it like some Street Fighter character about to uh, eliminate their opponent. And this is all kind of nice, but you think, what, what more can you do? Well, take these cards. These are interactive cards. As I said before, this isn't rehearsed. Sleight of hand and the interaction, and they become real. This is just the start. What about something a bit bigger? A magic cane. That's too big to fit in his pocket, and yet, perfect interaction with the Connect. It's not enough. We want more. We want an assistant. We want a glamorous assistant that will do anything that's asked of them. They will dance with you. They'll turn circles. But sometimes, even the artificial things aren't good enough. We want to be able to do the same interaction that we've seen before. We want to see this one come real. And There you go. This could be a breakthrough in magic. We're so used to seeing traditional magic or with the recorded background. This is truly interactive, and the, the bounds haven't even begun to be tested. Something a bit more fun and close to our own hearts. We all love rock band, so uh, how about getting rid of that stupid plastic guitar and having a, an augmented reality one instead? Obviously, this is just a guitar. You could have the drums, the triangle, if you were so inclined. But why limit yourself there? Why not go and make yourself into an instrument? So theremins are that weird BBC Doctor Who kind of noise. And uh, you can just about hear it coming in here. And it's important to notice what's happened here is it's mapped his body. It's located his hands. It's located the depth feel. Um, and using his body, he's able to control the theremin. So we've got one hand controlling the pitch and the other hand controlling the volume. But because we're not limited by the physics of a real theremin, we can do some cool stuff that you can't do, like modulate. Um, the other thing to notice is that he hasn't just stuck with having you know, interaction. He's also then fed that back onto his own image. And the, the colors you can see are actually correspond to the noises that the theremin are making. So it's quite a nice sort of example of both how to do the capture of motion and also layer that information back onto the image that you're displaying. So something a bit different now. Robots, we all love robots. Um, we've got here a, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. It's an Alboran Neo, which is a, an off-the-shelf robot that you can just buy and start experimenting with. And you can see here we've got the guy in blue on one side of the monitor. And as he moves his arms backwards and forwards, the robot moves their arms as well. This is skeletal. So it's actually not just mapping his motions. It's able to map his elbow joints. And uh, although they don't do it, I suspect they could probably make the robot jump as well. The landing is probably a bit iffy. Um, but obviously, this is of extreme importance to surgeons who are starting to use this type of technology to do teleoperations from one side of the world to the other. But robots are more than moving. Robots are seeing and interacting. And this is, uh, well, it's a, it's a fairly familiar setup. It, you know, it looks like a rumor. It's actually an iRobot Create Robot, which is another off the shelf kit. Everything you can see here is off the shelf. You know, you've got a standard CPU, you've got a standard laser rangefinder, and a standard battery. And what it does is it's designed to work inside your house. So it will go in, it will use the rangefinder and its software to do SLAM, which is a simultaneous location and mapping, which is where the robot is able to work out 
not just what the room is in looks like, but where it is in that room and how to navigate around the room. So quite familiar with the Roomba, and this is doing it with a Kinect. Um, and what you can see here is the big blue boundaries of the walls, um, and it's able to uh, continue trundling around. But robots in a room on their own is a bit artificial situation. It doesn't naturally happen. We have people. So it's also able to uh, detect people in the scene. Um, you can see here it's found that person. It's mapped their head, their arm, their hand on the end. And it can then interact with those people using gestures. So you can see here he's just commanded the robot to go over there. So this is the start of human-robot interaction with the Kinect. But it's not just about the house. This is uh, an example of um, the sort of technology you'd find in a UAV. It's able to work out where the ground plane of the room is, ignoring things like this uh, fire extinguisher and this chair. It will just work out. And uh, obviously, plenty of options for doing stuff with that. Something a bit more practical, something that businesses might want to start using. This was um, a top shop in Russia a couple of years ago. And uh, here's the fastest way to the changing rooms. You simply stand in front of the Connect and the video monitor, and it will try close on for you. So you've got little black numbers, and as you can see, it gives you a nice projection. It allows you to change the outfits. And the only people that really look at you are, or everyone else in the shop as you're waving your arms randomly in the middle of nowhere. Um, obviously, it's quite a crowd drawer, and uh, something else that helps with... Uh, all these types of things, of course, is doing the big promotion. And, and uh, you'll see in a minute, we've got a DJ in here, and everyone's dancing around. And uh, there's also that inhibitionist. Everyone wants to go out and have a go. Do, do we try this? Do we not? Women do it very easily. Would men do this in a store, do you think? Would they do it in Top Man? Would we go and look at a shirt and go, hmm, does that look nice? Well. I think we'll hopefully see in a second one brave young gentleman doing just that. And uh, at the moment, as you can see, they're just demonstrating. Here's our DJ. But they're demonstrating just waving left and right to change the, to change the clothes. And uh, here we have our brave gentleman who hasn't managed to find the men's clothing on this uh, virtual store, but seems quite happy trying on the dresses, you know, evening number, you know, something for a wedding, uh, perhaps even a little black number. Oh, yes, fantastic. <laughs> so. Uh, this is obviously a, an application that you can, there's several available like this. You can download them onto your Xbox now if you've got a Connect, and the source code is also available. So you can start hacking on top of someone else's application. Um, so another great opportunity to try something out. Teleconferencing, we all do it, I'm sure. Um, and as you can guess from this rather wordy title, this comes from a university, um, basically what they're doing is they're using Connects, commodity hardware, with commodity cameras, so cheap off-the-shelf cameras. And they're going beyond what we normally experience. So what they've actually got set up here is they've got a full connect in one room. Um, and they produce a, an overlapping screen, which is then meshed together, the same way that some of those uh, panorama technologies for your camera do, where you can take just a bunch of photos and it turns it into one big one. Um, it also has, as we can see here, um, this is the, the raw sort of impression that the, the system's building up. This is before it applies any other algorithms. So we have here the uh, color depth sample. This is because the Kinect isn't great at coloring in depth. So it uses normal cameras to uh, pick up the color field, meshes it together, smooths out patches where the mesh doesn't quite lie correctly. So it's able to detect contours and, and correct for where those contours are too rough. And then it also smooths out all the meshes in terms of the color depth. So you get this relatively smooth and seamless uh, appearance. And then finally, it adds dynamic color matching. Uh, again, like I said, the Kinect isn't great at the color in depth. So they layer yet another photograph on top to build up this 3D image. What's the point of doing all this in 3D? Well, the point is that they've got an auto stereograph. Um, auto stereo uh, image, which means that you don't need to wear 3D glasses to see this in 3D. This is one of the ones where you, it locates your eye position, as you can see here. This is done in 2D space. It then converts this into 3D tracking, uh, although it makes you look rather scary when you do. 
Um, so you can see here it's tracking his eyes both in 3 and 2D. And then it uses this to work out how to line the stereograph image up so that it appears as if you're looking directly into the person's eyes. Or so you can move your head around the side and sort of experience a proper 3D image. Because it uses eye tracking, though, in order to fool it into thinking that someone's staring at the screen, they have to uh, create this cardboard cutout of a mask and put the camera behind just one eye. Um, and when they do, this is the type of image that you can see. Uh, so that's kind of representative of, of what you would see as the person receiving a video call. Right now, they've only got this working in half duplex. So one person is able to send and the other to receive. But they are working, as you can see here, this is the half duplex setup. But they're working to get it into full duplex, which means that you'd be able to almost sit there and feel as if the person was almost in the room with you. So it's breaking down that, that barrier, especially as we move into more and more distributed economies where we work across the seas. This could be fantastically useful. Uh, this one's a bit gimmicky. It's probably one of the first things that everyone tries was when they're hacking. This is just depth capture. So this is snapshotting as someone walks through the scene and overlaying all the top. Uh, again, another quick one. This is using the shape of your hand to control a, a character. So this is virtual puppetry. Um, this was done at Java 1. So there's uh, lots more videos of this kicking around on parlays. Um, we all like getting physical. So here we get to do Minecraft and Mario Kart, where it's all controlled by the Kinect. And if you notice, this guy's actually jumping up and down to get the Mario character to jump up and down. And finally, this is a new take on Tetris, where the, uh, the image is actually orthogonal, and it's uh, maintained by the sort of position of your eyes and your head. Going one step further, getting rid of yourself in a video is you know, that classic predator effect. So we simply map the background over the person in the foreground. Uh, we can also do weird things like expand and balloon the body parts. So this is recognizing every shape and then doing a balloon on it. Uh, it's quite comical, but of course, it's even more comical when you do it to your cat. Uh, again, this is obviously something for animators to play with as possible. And everyone's seen this clip. Um, this is. Uh, augment reality and allow you to fight with a lightsaber. Um, I don't think you look any cooler, but it certainly looks more effective. Um, something that can be used in nightclubs, slicing control, so the connect could be used to watch people's body shape and change the lighting accordingly, or it's just something really fancy to show off with at Christmas. Um, <laughs> Nickel detection. We all have a problem nowadays that there's a lot of live TV, um, and live TV obviously comes with its own drawbacks, like streakers on a football pitch. Um, case in point. Um, also, sort of the other side of maintaining like children's protection. Um, so what he's got here is he, his body is uh, mapping. He's working out where his nipples are, and uh, when it's worked out, it covers them up. So we've got automatic censoring of his nipples. And every time it does, it plays some music as well. Um, absolute wide range of things that you can play save yourselves. Obviously, some items are quite effective at covering your nipples, like bras you know, of all different types. Records, maybe. But things with a hole in them don't have quite the same impact. Um, so how this is working is that, it, uh, like I said, it, it works out where his body is, works out roughly where his head is, and then it creates a, an area for his, his chest, and then takes the median of that to work out where his nipples should be and, high, and then cover them. Um, in a minute or two, uh, we should see him enabling the, uh, the wireframe that demonstrates how this all works. Um, Every time you notice the tracking, a bit of Lady Gaga, anyone? But every time you notice the tracking drops off, the music disappears as well as the, the chest covering. Um, so this is partly, I think, so that he could tell that it wasn't covered and re-trigger it. Um, so he does have a very unusual face when he's doing this, and must have enjoyed himself. Here we've got the uh, the outline. So you can see uh, the big purple box is mapping out his uh, general sort of rectangular shape and then it's got a, a slightly less accurate body mapping with its head and then finally it's got the yellow and square where it's locating is the middle of his chest and placing the uh, the nipple shields um, it doesn't have to be VR uh, augmented reality um, it works just as well with uh, a good projector 
Um, some of them are quite effective. Um, others, less so. Um, for example, bees. <laughs> um, so that's just a brief sampling of what you can do with the Kinect. I say brief because there really are a thousand more applications we didn't have time to find cool videos for. Um, all of this stuff you can do yourself. It's the library's there, and uh, Dan's going to give you a, a couple of ideas about what we did uh, for DevOps last year and how maybe you could use some of that in your own hacking. OK, so thanks, James. The first thing we decided to come up with was the problem. And the problem was that we had signage that was outside of each of the rooms. And as organizers, we had to update that signage should speakers fail to turn up or should the schedule change for any other reason. And this was a very manual task. We had to go around with tape, writing things on. And not just that, we had to get the boards printed. And these had to be printed weeks in advance. Whereas we really needed some scheduling information that was dynamic and responsive. We had that on the mobile interfaces and on people's laptops. So why couldn't we get this outside of the rooms? So the obvious solution to that is to replace them with monitors. We did that. And the next question was, can we make them interactive? And is there any benefit to doing so? So we came up with this layout, which provides the full room schedule on the right. It was critical to us that we didn't lose any information or any critical use cases of what the old system used to provide. And so we continue to have this on the right-hand side. We're now able to give more in-depth information about what's coming up next. As you can see, we've got this description of the talk itself. And we can then give you a, a, a highlight of what's coming up after that. As you can see, lunch is being dropped out. And it's just showing you the content that you actually really care about. Most areas, as you can see on here, uh, almost any, anything that's not gray can be clicked and you can drill down into. So if we pick Tor, for example, who at the time of writing worked for Google, and uh, uh, want to see what other presentations he was. I enjoyed his presentation style. I'd like to see what other talks this presenter is a part of. So we can see that he's a member of the Java Posse. And later today, he'll be up in room five. I can now change my agenda and go off and see that talk. The top left hand uh, is the home icon. We always gave that as a, a way of getting back to the, the home page so that we could consistently get back here. But what happens if I enjoyed this because it's a novice talk and I want to see what other novice talks are? So if I hover over novice, it'll now tell me what other novice talks are available for the remainder of the week. It won't tell me what I've just missed because there's no point in that. It'll just tell me what's coming up. So these numbers will um, reduce over time. So if we drill down to architecture, I now get just a list of the novice architecture talks, and this can effectively build my agenda for me. And I can do all of this stood outside of a room, just having been enthused by the presentation I've just seen. So how does this actually fit together? Well, as I, uh, as I dare to threaten the demo gods, we'll see if this works. So there's three main components. The first one is that uh, a library that we use called Open Native uh, inter, um, Interactions. Uh, oh, sorry, Open Natural Interactions. And this uh, is a C framework library that you can download and is built for all the common platforms, including, in this case, Max. So if we run this, and I pity anyone who has to spend their life in Xcode. So, well, this application starts up. Unfortunately, it's not the fastest thing in the world. What we have is our um, connect, connected up over USB, and a standard image um, quadrant chart that you'll see up. As you see, it's picked up one of my hands already. And what we need now is so it's, it's picked up this dot. It's now needing to be able to tell something this dot. We wonder, well, we could write the entire application in C, but that's a lot of work, and I really don't like Xcode. I really don't like Xcode. And so, we decided that wonder if we could use WebSockets to pump this out over UDP, stick it into a web browser, and have the web browser then render the application. What you saw before was a web application. We've used it on various clients. People are clicking around with their mouse. Why can't we just use your hand to navigate around? OK, so we thought, what's the best way of getting it across? So we first started off with a C library, and then they changed the uh, implementation of WebSockets far too many times, and we decided to go for Node. 
So Node doesn't scale that well, but in this case it was perfect because we have one application that's trying to talk to a web browser. Node took the UDP data and spat it out perfectly. So over here we have Node. Okay. Picking up the coordinates. So the three coordinates we actually care about are X, Y, and Z. That's all we care about um, from the position of the hand, but there may be multiple people milling around. Usually it's not just me on a stage demonstrating this. So we also have the hand ID. And as it's logging out each of these messages, it's actually spitting out to any websites listening. We have Node actually serving up the web files as well. A bit of magic, we have our website. So one of the benefits of doing it this way is that I can move it with my mouse. I can move around, I can click around, and that gives me, it means that I can be on a plane or a train, I, I don't have to have a connect set up and ready and waiting. So the web developers can be split away from the technology that's going to ultimately drive it. So as it picks up my hand, it decides not to work. And so here we have Roman Guy. And as we pick up, it worked before. Never mind. Threaten the demigods, what do you get? So I'll move my hand with my mouse. And you can just trust me, it works. Everything else is there. It just, and it worked in rehearsals. It just doesn't work now. So hovering up, going back to the home page, we can go off and see Sticky Gooey's, which had Roman and Chet. I like Chet, so let's go see what else Chet is doing. And we can drill down and get a bunch more information. This makes it far more interactive. And we were constantly asking our questions uh, of ourselves as to what is it that the attendees want to know as soon as they come out of their presentation. Are they, they're obviously going to either have liked the presentation and want more information, or if they didn't, they want to avoid this and move on to something else. Security was a big drive, and I did have people asking me in years gone by what other security talks are around, because we didn't have that exposed as well as we do architecture and core talks. And so, as I shut this down, we can delve a bit more into how, how we actually do this. And so the Kinect itself is a commodity piece of hardware. You can pick them up for under 100 pounds now. They're almost disposable. And they're getting more and more so as other pieces of hardware that have got similar capabilities are coming onto the market. This one in particular has two stereoscopic cameras. And uh, they use that to build the depth map that we were seeing before and have a visible um, VGA camera, and that can be zoomed in and focus on things like faces and can be used to take the funny photos that get published onto social networks. It has a microphone and enables you to talk to it, um, although it has no intelligence within it of itself. Uh, all the processing has to be done on the computer. That means it's very power hungry. This managed to drain my eight hour back laptop battery in under 30 minutes on a flight. It does need external power, and uh, uh, don't jerry-rig it up to a planes entertainment system. It doesn't have brilliant effects. So the two images that come out, come out from the USB interface itself are a VGA picture and a depth map. We can uh, overlay these, and the depth map for each pixel is commonly shown as a raster chart, as you saw before in the typical quadrant view in the top left-hand corner. It does gesture recognition via open uh, natural interaction. Open Framework has extensions used for binding that plug into the open computer vision library. These are all available for common platforms for Mac, OS, uh, Mac OS X, Windows, and Linux. And they're easy to download and compile. They're updated regularly, and there is a lot of, computer, uh, of community involvement around it. Blob recognition is generally what you, you start with. Uh, rather than trying to identify the fingers as in the first uh, hack we saw, it 
just locates the things on the ends of your arms. And uh, so the, the libraries that we involved to pull all this together and we ended up using for our stack was Open Frameworks, which is a C++ toolkit, and they describe it as it's for creative coding. It's an open framework extension. Um, they have their own add-on site, and you can run through the hundreds, if not thousands now, that they have. We, in particular, wanted to hook up in the computer vision library, which has all the real-time vision processing. And again, that runs on the platforms that we need it to. Angular is the JavaScript framework that we chose to use. We could have gone for the likes of Backbone, but we wanted something that was much more rapid to build together. We basically put this together in a weekend, and we needed something that was pretty much ready to go out of the box. You could choose whichever framework you wanted to. Uh, jQuery, invaluable as always. It should be in everyone's toolkit, I guess. Socket IO and the node uh, modules were really easy to pull up and put together. You'll see soon just how little code that we need to use. Um, we were getting Socket IO for the web sockets. We used Express, which is a Sinatra uh, inspired JavaScript node framework, and that's built on Connect for supporting web development. And CoffeeScript, which is a little language that makes JavaScript a little less awkward. Uh, HP proxy was useful, and we had to use that to get around the cause problem of the cross orange origin uh, in order to pull in things like the tweet wall or to be able to get notices from the website. The system architecture um, being built on all these gave us three distinct components. We had a user interface, which was easy to farm out to standard web developers. Uh, they were able to brand that up and have that ready for us to go. We used the C application to integrate with the Connect, and we had the Node.js server in the middle plugging it all together. But Node would also be able to do some other things like detecting which server it's on, so the server name would determine which room it was and it could automatically deploy for us. It made the deployment scenario slightly less awkward. So the Connect application itself, built on top of Open Frameworks, was primarily there just to identify any hands in the scene and which, which is the dominant hand, which we determined to be the closest. We put a white line on the floor to guide people where to stand, because you have to stand a lot further back from a Connect than you would expect to. And we also needed something to stop people going on and poking the TV screen, because we had nothing protecting it, and the last thing we wanted to do was to replace one of those. So we serialized the hand down to the XYZ coordinates, as you saw before, and punted them over in JSON, and streamed that in a UDP port doesn't matter if it's lossless, it just matters that the stream continues. This is what the code looks like for the Connect app. This is roughly the sum of the code that we changed um, with, the, um, with, with the next two slides. So you can see there's a list of, that comes out of the box with um, open uh, natural interaction that allows you to set whether it's live. So are we taking the data from the Connect itself? We can record it, which is really, really useful for being able to play back offline. So we can continue development without having a Connect plugged in. When you do that, it still is power hungry because the processing is pretty intensive as it's quite naive at the moment. They are working on pushing some of that over to things like the GPU, but they're not quite there yet. Tracking uh, splits into two different areas. Are we tracking bodies, or are we doing a skeletal um, goalpost-style tracking to be able to detect where the various components in the arms are? Filtering uh, allows us to do hand-based tracking, as that allows us to subtract the background you saw in the predator type. That's doing a, an, um, using the filtering algorithms. We just use it there to get rid of everything we don't care about to reduce the processing so that we don't need to use 100% of CPU of uh, five cores for the entirety of DevOps, that uh, we wouldn't have much left of our Mac minis if we did. The recording is the option to push it back to the live, and uh, we can do both live, be live, and record it at the same time, and that can be useful for diagnostic purposes, especially when you're trying to debug why when you wave three times does it not work. It gets that consistency in a little bit more and can even help you drive in an iterative manner. So the cloud point background allows you to subtract the background. So rather than, so doing the opposite of what you saw in the predator style demo, where instead of uh, um, hiding yourself, you hide everything else. And instead of doing that by knowing what the background is and subtracting it, it's doing it by locating you in the depth field and subtracting anything behind that. 
it gives you a very crisp and clean way of doing effective blue screening. And you've got masking and drawing to do those sorts of things. Drawing is very useful. If you're going to put this in production, make sure you turn drawing off. Uh, drawing, draw, drawing, drawing off, reduced by 30% the CPU load. So this is all that all this does is take JSON from a point and uh, and take a point and turn it into JSON, uh, doing uh, string concatenation. And here we just put punt it out to the socket, and that is the sum of the code changes that we ultimately made uh, to the application. It did take us around about three hours to get up and running, but with these sorts of uh, uh, taking this sort of code and running with it, you should be up and, um, up and running within five minutes. So the application in the middle, we needed to proxy JSON messages across, and we thought this was gonna be really complex. We're taking a UDP packet, we have to take the string, turn it into JSON, and then we have to push it out on a web socket, which is a different protocol. And then we're gonna have to serve HTML and CSS and all these other static resources that are going to go up. And we also needed to provide a REST endpoint in order to determine what the, the host name of the application was, and not listed on here, is the proxying that we had to do on top of that. So this is the massive code that does all of that. I was really quite impressed when uh, uh, this, this is the sum of our app.js. So the left hand side is the UDP socket listener, web socket server, and, and broadcasting, um, split into those three chunks, as well as the includes at the top. And the right-hand side uses the static resources serving, um, including the manifest files, for REST endpoints, and does proxying down at the bottom. Uh, I, I really enjoyed working with Node. It was nice, simple, very straightforward, and the amount of documentation out there that gets you working quick is really helpful. And then we built our HTML5 application on the other side that was taking all of this WebSocket information and doing something with it. We could have used Backbone, Handlebars, Mustache, or a bunch of other libraries, but Angular offered the rapid building and uh, little learning uh, curve required. So Angular and jQuery, we ended up using jQuery mainly for its futures and events, and that provided a brilliant uh, base infrastructure. And so having a live event-driven user interface allowed us to do a, a lot of offline and online testing so that we could have this, so it automatically picks up the current date and time, the current room where, you, where you're at, and pull all this data off a JSON feed, or you can have the events manually fired by putting a, a hash bang tag in the URL, put debug up there, and it just feeds that off a static XML file stored locally. It meant that we could nicely segregate the development of the application from the source controller, and the connect is now just another human interactive device albeit one that is better than having a mouse dangling in midair that you try and control yourself. The back doors we added were to move uh, time forward and backwards to allow us to see what it would be like at 3 p.m. or check that it's filtering out. The interaction possibilities uh, that were all done uh, on the client side, we, we actually hit quite a stumble earlier on and we weren't sure how to do this because we had to go back to the basic principle of we don't want this to be a gimmick. We want this to actually provide some value. This, of course, is the hackery of how do I get this stuff across, but what's the point in doing something unless it's actually generally going to provide value? You saw at Topshop where that could actually provide business value and has been turned into a, a real business application. How could we get that across? And the second question we had to ask ourselves was how are people going to interact with this? As they walk up to this, the, the screen, how are they going to know what to do? The, it's not like with a mouse or a keyboard. Everyone knows how to interact with those. Hell, even an iPhone or a tablet, people know things like pinch to zoom. And they, we don't have this within the non-touch uh, non inter interaction world. So clicking, is that a grabbing motion? Is it an open, closed hand, closed hand motion? I mean, it can't be that. That's really unintuitive, and you have to train someone how to do that. Is it pushing through a plane, so you're reaching in and grabbing something? We settled on hovering over something, because that was the clearest, and showing a line filling up. It's also one that Xbox games used as a circle filling up. And so we know that there was some, some, some research has gone into that, and we kind of settled on that. 
Zooming was a great idea, because we actually initially started off with thinking this could be a Google Maps, because the DevOps theme was an island, and we thought we could make the DevOps theme uh, and replicate it as an island in Google Maps, and people could go in and zoom around. And we had it mocked up, and we had people stretching it out, but we had no way to determine when they'd started or stopped stretching, and so that fell apart. So that, that still isn't a problem we solved, and if anyone comes across a way of dealing with zooming, I would be interested to find out as to how that becomes a natural interaction. Swiping was something that we did really simply. We just did bound detection between the right and the left, and if you move over to the right, across to the left, that swipe and go back and forth. Those sorts of interactions we put in quite quickly, and if we had more time, I think we would have put different shapes in. So sticking your hand up may have taken you home, for example. They're relatively easy to do within JavaScript, and there's actually a bunch of libraries that do them. We just didn't have time to integrate. So the first thing that we did was to, was to use my child. Uh, I had a, a five-year-old who was four at the time, and I went along to a nursery. She, she was in nursery at the time sat them down in front of a screen, not dissimilar to this, and put tux paint on. I sat the connect in front of it, but it wasn't plugged in. It was merely there to provide a distraction so that they weren't thinking that this was a touch screen, this was something new, and it gave them something to focus on. And then I sat there with a mouse and just asked them, can you paint something for me? Can you change it to a black pen? And just see what they did. Told them that you can see them, and it will understand what they do. And watching them without any prior education to interacting, it was enlightening. And I found that really, really useful. And it's something that will use in my business life far more of getting consumers involved with interfaces in a mocked scenario helps me come up with different interactions. And we had, we had toddlers running up and grabbing the screen. Some of the older kids in the nursery were standing up and waving at it. And I thought that, that was interesting. Uh, they really did just stand up and wave to, at it, and which is why we kept the waving motion to detect your hand. And we had them trying to stretch it. We had them moving their hand around and hovering. And it was uh, interesting as you could uh, replicate their movements with the mouse and try to interpret what they're up to. So that, that drew us down to click to hover and move, waving to start off, as well as swiping. Um, just about every child there was swiping to try and go back and forth, uh, or to undo, as we were asking them to do. So we brought ourselves back to the, be the beginning and reminded ourselves that the primary purpose of it is to be signage, and we have to continue the, to deliver the important information. So the lessons that we learned from running through of this process is that the user experience is king. And I labored on that point before for a purpose, because it really is king, queen, and country. If the user experience is poor, people won't enjoy using your application. And I, as I mentioned, I hate Xcode, because the user experience for me is incredibly poor compared to the other development environments I use. And for that reason, I don't use it, and I don't like to use it, and I avoid it at cost. And if we're developing software, we should be developing software that people lust after, that people want to use and want to be involved with. And that encourages adoption, and it encourages distribution amongst the people. Keep asking yourself why. Why, why are you doing this piece of functionality, or why are you adding this feature? And what, could this be simpler? Could I be getting this information across in a better way? And make sure that it's not the gimmick. And make sure you're adding value to the experience of them interacting. And test the interface before you build it rushing ahead and making assumptions. We're really glad that we did that exercise with the, with the nursery group, as without that, I think we would have made bad choices and it would have been a failure. Know the hardware you're running on. So we ran off Mac minis, and we <laughs> made the fatal assumption that all Mac minis are equal, and there was significant variation in the hardware, which caused all sorts of performance problems. So even down to just the CPUs being slightly different on uh, uh, applications which are CPU hungry, know your bounds and know what effects you're going to um, have running on different pieces of hardware. We eventually managed to unify them. Given our time again, we put a, would have probably gone with a closure, Java application. It would have uh, fit well 
there is Greenfoot, which I'll mention in a bit, uh, which is a Java application rather than uh, for a library for interacting with the Connect rather than using the uh, C applications that we were using. The single node application with C bindings would have been an option as well, but uh, we didn't have chance to get down to that point. Understand the capabilities of the hardware you're using. The resolution of the camera really could be better. It's, uh, it's remarkable how easily you forget how low resolution the VGA camera actually is. And the power consumption and CPU utilization for processing is extremely high. So evolving this, we could use Greenfoot, which as I mentioned is a Java uh, library. It's, it's um, aimed at teaching Java so it makes everything really, really simple. It has Connect integration and is pretty much ready to go out of the box. If I was doing this over again, I would start here. Processing is made some leaps and bounds in what's possible. And so it makes some really, really simple things look beautifully stunning. The art installation we saw before with the dancers being overlaid, that was processing. Uh, OS Skeleton is a protocol, uh, proxy which sends skeletal information along with the OSC um, information from the Connect. In making anything that pulls in OSC information as a standard, um, instantly able to use the Connect as a, an alternative input source. So the other possibilities that we can get. So we could build virtual card walls. We've seen this uh, used at uh, a, an organization that was split across two geographic locations and wanted that, to have their card wall, in this case using Greenhopper, uh, displayed in two places with audio transmitted uh, in both sides. But then as one team moved the card, they wanted it to be updated in real time on the other side. And it's actually worked out really, really well for them. They were doing a big relocation from London to another place. And as they were doing that, this bridged the gap and allowed the teams to not be as productive as they were in their stand-ups when they were all together, but was the next best thing. It was certainly far better than clicking around with a mouse. Crowded capacity control we can do through uh, seat management. Uh, the Connect is able to pick up and locate pretty much everyone in this room if we put it high enough. Uh, allows us to do all sorts of really quite cool and interesting things. A uh, psychologist who was do, uh, researching the wisdom of crowds um, took an audience um, about the, size, the same size as this room and gave them some cards and split the audience down the middle. On the left-hand side, they had red and green cards effectively, and on the right-hand side, they had the same. And they then just produced on the screen a raster chart of what it saw you have. So it would, if there were 800 seats in the room, it showed 800 seats on the screen and would show whether it think you had a red or a green card. Let them play for a while and then replace that with a Pong game and had a paddle. So split the room in half. On the left-hand side, if there's more red than green, it goes up. If it's the inverse, it goes down. And the same for the right-hand side. And the interesting thing that came out of that was that the get, they actually started as a group to, without any communication or any training, started to play Pong. And then finally, they flipped it out and showed a aeroplane simulator with the countdown from three to one and then told the audience to land the plane. And they managed it. It was pretty impressive stuff. And if you go and search for Wisdom of Crowds and uh, Wisdom of Crowds audience, it should pop up on Google for you. Uh, touch screens, it enables this to be, become a touch screen. If you were to angle it downwards, it could detect where your hands are on the screen and have multiple people all using the screen at the same time. Clearly, there's some dead spots if you've got two people's hands above each other, but generally speaking, if you've got three people lined up alongside of it, it can even get as close as knowing where your fingers are. Controlling things like presentations um, or remote controlling Androids or other components like your Hoover. Um, we already have, see this happening within TVs. Um, the latest models from Samsung, I believe, for their TVs um, have software that can detect you in the room. It can detect if no one's there and turn itself off. It can detect you when you sit down at your, your couch. So it doesn't turn itself on if you walk through the room, but it does if you sit down ready to watch TV. Even detect who you are, either for parental locking or from just identifying that Dan sat here and Dan likes to watch the news at 6 p.m., so let's put the news on for him. There's some really interesting possibilities that come up, but also that raises some interesting privacy concerns. 
as well as the interactive art and musical instruments we saw earlier. Prototypes already exist for this sort of stuff, so perhaps we're not too far off this becoming mainstream. So I hope that you've uh, in enjoyed this wild and meandering road through uh, what the Kinect can do, what we did, and how you guys can get up and running with this. And I hope it's inspired you to give it a try. So thank you.